Or, I yeah. can see my own slides on the screen there, but oh, there we go. Okay, I'll hand you over to Colin. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Donald. Um, thanks for having me, folks. Thanks for having me back. Um, way back, long and long ago at, at INOG-C, I had a variant of this slide on screen, and I said I wouldn't talk about submarine cables because we were tight for time, and I promised I'd come back and talk about them again. And Donald and Christian very foolishly said, sure, you can absolutely come and do that. So I'm going to talk about submarine cables, and more importantly, I'm going to talk about some of the, the origin story of submarine cables and the impact that a particular Irishman um, had on all of the fundamental advances that made submarine cables possible. So we're going to talk about that. So first of all, we've got to insert some standard disclaimers. Today I'm here in a personal capacity, so I'm not representing my employer. Don't blame them for any of the crazy you're about to experience. Um, but there's also another much more personal disclaimer I need to make this evening, and that's that I'm somewhat of a submarine cable nerd. Um, and, and how much you ask, and I'm going to say quite a lot. So first of all, I'm going to say that um, I used to work in a cable landing station as part of Hibernia Atlantic, so I used to sit there and go, ooh, look, there's a button, and if I touch that, the thing in Halifax breaks. Um, and so that was good fun. I got to really get hands-on and, and touch a lot of the hardware. Uh, this photograph was taken by a former colleague of mine, Owen Kenny. This was actually taken on board the Cable Innovator cable ship back in 2011 when it was installing the Celtic Connects cable. That is actually the Celtic Connects cable, um, the Dublin end uh, on, on, the cab on the ship that was being terminated before it went out into Dublin Bay. Um, just out of shot, there was a nice segment where they, they, lamin they put a bunch of laminated plastic on the cable and got everyone to sign it. So my signature is on a submarine cable uh, somewhere. But it turns out I'm even more of a cable nerd than that. Um, so here's a test. What's this? This is like a test for who else are the cable nerds in the building. Um, I'll give you a clue. Sorry? No, it's not. This is, this is what I'm going to call like the best honeymoon destination ever. Uh, it is, in fact, the Port Curnow Submarine Telegraph Cable Museum, um, which I brought my wife to on our honeymoon. Uh, <laughs> Yes, we're still married. It turned, out, it turned out I married a museum nerd, so that was a, that was a win. Um, I was actually talking about this talk uh, to a colleague of mine about a week ago, and they were like, oh, 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 you've got to tell them about the Cable Museum in Port Curnow. And I'm like, how do you know about it? And they were like, I went there on my honeymoon. Uh, so it turns out there are, in fact, two of us. We are both still married, so I can save with safety. It's 100% success rate. Um, so yeah, uh, that's how much of a cable nerd I am. I do absolutely recommend the Port Curnow Cable Museum, it is great. Um, you get to see and play with lots of the stuff I'm going to talk about. Um, and then right next door, there's actually an outdoor Greek theater carved in a cliff, which is also kind of crazy. Uh, turns out Cornwall is full of crazy people. So we're going to talk about our history. Uh, and here's our hero for this evening's story. Uh, this is William Thompson. Uh, he was born in 1824 in Belfast. That's my definition of Irish for the purposes of tonight's talk. Um, that, foot, that statue of him is actually in the Botanic Gardens in Belfast, if you're wandering around up there. Uh, he moved to Glasgow in 1833. His dad was a, a professor. Um, turns out he was pretty smart. Um, at the age of 22, he was appointed the chair of natural philosophy at Glasgow University. Um, he was put in charge of the entire, basically, science and physics there. He spent 50 years in that job. Um, he did a bunch of useful stuff. Uh, in his mid to late 20s, he invented a bunch of the laws of thermodynamics, um, proved that there was such a thing as an absolute zero. Um, much later in life, he became Baron Kelvin. Uh, yes, that Kelvin, they named the temperature scale after him. Um, but at the point where we're going to start our story in the early 1850s, he's basically unknown. He's written all this cool stuff. There's about 20 people in the world know he's a genius. Um, but the modern, most of society has no clue who he exists, that he exists. So every good story, he has a hero, needs an anti-hero. So here's our antagonist. Uh, he is a guy called Edward Whitehouse. He is a surgeon by training. And in his spare time, he likes to believe he's a hobbyist electrical experimenter. Um, and he's really good about talking about how great he is. Um, so he got himself the job somehow of being the chief electrician to the Atlantic Telegraph Company. Um, seems an odd job for someone who's a, a doctor, but he managed to talk people into it. It seems his primary qualification for this was he was, good about he was good at telling people how great things were going to be. So he was basically hired as a marketing person and really less uh, for his technical jobs. So the plan of the Atlantic Telegraph Company was to string a cable from Valencia and Kerry to Newfoundland and Canada uh, in the 1850s. That sounds easy, right? So they said, 
people give us about 350,000 pounds, uh, which at the time was about 200 million, uh, and we are going to build a cable, string it across the ocean, and then we will make profit. So as much as you think venture capitalists today are kind of foolhardy, let's just say this was incredible seat of the pan stuff. No one had made a telegraph cable that worked more than about 100 miles on land, and they went, sure, it's a couple of thousand miles across an ocean, easy peasy. Uh, we've got this guy, William w or Edward Whitehouse, he tells us it's great. Um, and so they were trying to fundraise for this, and so they, uh, Edward Whitehouse was busy uh, publishing articles in a, in a journal, in this case called the Anatheum. Uh, it's like Reddit, but for Victorian hipsters. That's the way I describe it to people. Um, slightly heavier moderation, you have to wait before you see the posts, but he'd been publishing these articles going, this cable's gonna be great, it's trivial, there's no hard problems here, it's easy. Um, and everyone thought, yay, this is gonna be great. Uh, it turns out he wasn't alone, he had people like Faraday and Morse, you know, we've heard of them. They were going, yeah, this is totally gonna be easy. Uh, a buddy of Thompson said, hey, have you seen this nonsense this guy's writing? Uh, he went, oh my God, this guy's crazy. Did some math, went, this is gonna be a disaster. Uh, started publishing counter articles to that and Q. Flaymore. Um, turns out, you know, Victorian era Flaymore. At this point, suddenly Victorian society goes, hey, who's this Thompson guy? He seems to be picking a fight here. This is, uh, so this went on for a couple of months and the people involved in the submarine cable project said, this guy sounds smart, we should totally have him involved. So they appointed him to the board of the Atlantic Telegraph Company and said, you're gonna be our scientific advisor. They kept the crazy doctor, part-time electrician, said he's still in charge of the actual design, but you give him advice and it'll all be fine, right? Um, so this went on, they kept White House, they, Hugh proceeded to ignore most of Thompson's advice. He went, um, so they took their giant bag of money and said, let's build a cable. And so the first attempt, this is a photo of HMS and Magnon, which they borrowed from the Royal Navy to try this, this trick. Uh, turns out White House got seasick, and so couldn't actually go out on the ship. Uh, so Thompson goes out going, this would be interesting, let's go see what these people are doing. I've already solved thermodynamics. This cable thing looks fun. Um, so they go out in 1857. Um, they get about 600 kilometers out into the Atlantic and the cable breaks um, due to the stress of laying it off the seabed. This is the point where Thompson realizes that no one else involved has any clue what they're doing. And he's like, what are you people at? What? And they're like, no, 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 we just, we, we go at a certain speed and we let the cable out at the same rate. And no, 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 it just breaks then. And he's like, oh, no, no, no. So he goes and does a bunch of work to prove that when you're doing this, when you're laying a cable out the back of a ship, it doesn't go in a straight line down, it has a nice curve. And the length of that curve is dependent on how fast you're going and how deep the water is. And so if you're going, if you're going out to sea and it's getting deeper, you have to lay the cable out faster than you're traveling horizontally. And if you're on rough waves, it goes up and down much, so you need a bit more slack. And so he's like, he does all this great theoretical work and publishes it. And he goes, so right, how deep is the water? And they go, oh, we don't know. Turns out surveying is hard because we haven't figured out how to do that properly. He's like, oh. So he has to go figure out and invent an entirely new methodology to figure out how to do actual bathymetric surveys properly and without going bankrupt. Um, he patents this as well. You'll discover it's gonna be a recurring theme where he finds people are being stupid and patents stuff. So he figures, so along the way he's figured out how not to break the cable when you're letting off the ship. And he figures out how to actually take depth surveys properly so that we don't A, break the cable, or B, run the ship aground. Uh, it turns out he, he solved those problems. Um, but they've obviously broken this cable, so they're gonna go back and try again. So they take two more attempts uh, to do this. And so actually in August 1858, they finally managed to get the cable in one piece from Kerry all the way to Newfoundland. And it doesn't work really. Um, turns out, yeah, it takes them an entire day to send one telegram, the first telegram that they all put on the paper going, look, Queen Victoria sent a telegram to President Buchanan. That took them an entire day to s transmit. They're averaging at peak one word per minute. Um, this is like the worst thing ever. And so the pressure is now on White House, who spent like three years telling everyone that this is totally gonna work and it's gonna be easy um, to, to deliver. He's like, he's now feeling the heat because it turns out this thing's not gonna make everyone's money back and they want their 200 million back. Uh, Thompson, the meanwhile, is sitting on the side going, no, 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 I can do like th a character every three and a half seconds. Just please let me plug, please, please let me do it. Um, and so everyone's ignoring him. White House, like the bit of a goon he is, says the answer to this is more power. Um, so he goes off and he builds a bunch of five foot long induction coils and hauls them all the way down to Kerry, which is a bit of a, a trek, and decides the way we're gonna solve this problem is we're gonna put 2,000 volts on this here cable and we're, that's gonna get the signal all the way to Newfoundland. Um, proceeds to literally blow a hole in the cable. Um, blows the cable up somewhere under the seabed. The cable now has a big hole in it and is now basically a very expensive piece of scrap metal strung across the Atlantic, it's totally dead. 
uh, a total write-off. Um, very expensive write-off. There's a lot of people going, hey, where's our money? They're now very, very, very unhappy. Um, and this is where our Thompson comes back into the picture. Because it turns out, while White House was off building his giant induction coils, Thompson, who'd spent the last year and a half uh, telling everyone they were wrong, had actually been busy building, designing, building, and patenting a better system. Um, so he'd figured out the answer wasn't more power, that the answer was to build better instruments. And so the device on the left is actually what he called a mirror galvanometer. And it's basically a tiny mirror with some magnets on the back hung by a single piece of floss or silk thread and a coil back. And so basically the tiny voltages in the cable were enough to tilt the mirror. And you stared at a piece of paper with a white dot on it. And as the mirror tilted, the dot would move left or right. And that's how they did dots and dashes. Uh, turns out that worked really well. It actually did manage the three and a half characters per second. And it turns out while Thompson had been or White House had been off building his induction coils, uh, Thompson had actually put this on the cable and had been busy sending all the telegraph messages for the five weeks. Um, so he'd actually proved his stuff worked. Um, and But then White House blew the cable up. Um, so at this point, this was a huge, huge scandal. This was like a massive scandal in the Victorian era. Such a big scandal, in fact, that the very first tribunal of inquiry was created. All of the legislation that underpins tribunals of inquiry here in the UK stems from this fight. Um, Parliament established the tribunal of inquiry and went, we've got to figure out which of you two clans just lost us all our money, uh, what we're going to do about it. They heard lots of testimony. Um, and in the end, the, the, the tribunal said, White House is an idiot. Thompson's great. Uh, put him in charge of building the next one. Um, so Thompson is put in charge of building the next one in 1863, and they go off to try this again. They raise a bunch more money. A uh, bunch more drama happens here in 1865. The first attempt using uh, the Great Eastern gets about 2,000 kilometers out into the Atlantic, and the, the, the cable breaks due to bad weather. Um, and they're like, whoopsie, got to go back, get a new cable. So they get a new cable. They manage to stretch that all the way across the Atlantic in only about two weeks. They successfully get it there. And then on the way back, the captain of the ship says, I know what we're going to do. We're going to try and find the broken end of that cable in the middle of the Atlantic from last year. And he himself and Thompson pull it off. So they manage to find the other end of the cable, recover it, and then finish that cable. And so they actually, in August 1866, delivered two transatlantic telegraph cables um, uh, that work. Yeah, Thompson and the other cohorts in this scheme probably get knighted in, in November. Going, congratulations. Uh, the cable makes about a thousand pounds per day, which is a pretty healthy chunk of profit. It was in fact the only telegraph cables across the Atlantic. They had the monopoly. They were doing really well. They had the monopoly until about 1869 when the French built a cable that Thompson helped them build. And as soon as that came along, they all sat down and went, hey, we don't really want price competition. We should agree on a pricing structure. Uh, and that was the beginning of cartel-like behavior. Um, so at this point, Thompson is rolling in all the money because he's patented everything. Um, he, he thinks, you know, this uh, thing of staring at paper sounds like a bad idea. So he goes and builds a thing called a siphon ribbon recorder, which is a little hollow glass tube, very first fiber involved in data transmission, that sits there and is constantly vibrating um, and has a siphoning from an inkwell. And a little voltage can just move it left and right. And so it leaves a trace high and low based on the voltage. Uh, so that's the first fiber optic data transmission in the world. Uh, patents this as well rolls in yet more money, buys himself a giant 126-ton schooner to live on, and just potters around uh, the Mediterranean for the rest of his life. Uh, along the way, he got annoyed about the fact that marine compasses were crap, so he built better ones of those and patented that. And then got annoyed people couldn't predict the tide, so he built some tide-predicting machines um, and patented that. Um, and so yeah, basically, Thompson made it all possible. He was, he was from Ireland um, and was a big success. And so that is basically the history of submarine cables in Ireland. So I'll take some questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> we got Christian. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Colin. <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Christian has got a, want the next question, the next prize, I think. Uh, just as we're getting ready for for Chilla. Oh yeah, questions. I was just. Yeah, I was just, yeah, just don't found it. Just just like, oh. They're gonna come back to me. It'll be fine. Has uh, anyone got questions for Colin? He could probably answer pretty much anything you're gonna throw at him on this uh, topic. Anyone? They're scared. Okay, they, you're total fine. cable geek. So I've got I've got a bonus slide. <laughs> um, bonus slide. Where's my? So bonus slide. So I brought this along a little prop for later. Um, so this it turns out, this is a family heirloom that was floating around in a cardboard box in my house as a child. 
got it from somewhere. This is actually a sample of the coax cable that was run between Dublin and Cork in 1950, the 1950s. Uh, it's got 108 pairs for voice. There's two coaxes in the middle for doing TV and radio transmission down to Cork for, or for what was about to be RTE at the time. And then there's some other bits in the middle for doing telegraph and actually for doing studio links down to Cork for they do broadcasting back from Cork. Um, so I actually have it with me this evening. So when we're doing the, the social session later, if people want to come up and have a look, you can come talk to me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Colin. Thanks, we'll give him a round of applause. <laughs> so if anybody does have any questions for Colin, I'm sure you'll uh, oblige I'll probably make uh, answer, afterwards. <laughs> okay, over to you. All right. So before, we, before our next talk, I have a question for you. So who's the first who can tell me what is the length, the range of LR fiber? That's long reach fiber. Well done, sir. There you go. Whoop. 10, kilomet 10 kilometers. Paging Chila. 